Welcome everyone. Uh, for those who have not met me yet, I'm Jeff Skipper, author of Dancing with Disruption. I'm happy to have you with me today. We're going to plunge into the topic responding to resistance in just a moment. Before we do that, we'll say a couple words just to get us going. Um, not only if you haven't met me, I've been around working in the uh, field of change leadership for a lot of years now. Lots of gray hair because of that. I'm pleased to have with me today Serge Shaw. Uh, Serge, you can come on and say hello to folks. Serge is an expert in the area of IT and training. Hello. And uh, we worked together on a project uh, and uh, great respect for his skills. So he volunteered his time to help me out with the moderation today. So he's going to be monitoring the chat and uh, ensuring I, I capture comments because I can't do a presentation and watch that at the same time, as many of you well know. So let us begin. I'll share my screen again. I thought before I jumped into today's topic, I would give you a bit of background on well, what does it take to, to create a book? Because I get asked this all the time, you know, how long did it take you? And effectively, it was just over a year. Uh, so it began with a trip to Cabo. Uh, so I, I'm a little unique in this way. I'd, I'd read someone else did this and thought it was a good idea. And thought, well, I want to write a book. I really need some isolation and space to think and, and um, uh, come up with some new ideas. And so I booked a trip to Mexico, um, you know, uh, reserved a really nice room. And uh, yes, I did see the sun periodically during that, but a lot of time inside writing and just focused on collecting my thoughts to put together the book. Um, and then you return from that and you start working again because, you know, I've got clients and need to put food on the table um, and time begins to pass. So I, I'd written about 75, 80 percent of the book while away in Cabo. So very productive time. But then you come back and all the distractions of life and the work you have to do can can really pull you away. And I prioritize my clients. So uh, I didn't get a lot further until I partnered with a friend in Australia. And uh, he and I would check in regularly and he could say, Jeff, have you written more on the book? Have you finished? Like, no, no, I haven't. And finally said, I'm coming to Canada for a conference in September. Uh, and I said, okay, I will finish the book by the time you arrive. And I did. Well, then what? I needed help. So um, I decided I wanted to self-publish. So who could help me get this book from a Microsoft Word document into a presentable physical copy that some of you have in your hands? And so I needed help with that. I hired a, a publishing specialist and they did all sorts of wonderful things, but it was mainly, Jeff, we're going through the edit process. You got to read the book top to bottom, make sure all is in order. Um, and so I did that. And um, it's interesting reading your own work, not always easy, top to bottom. And you can get really critical of yourself, which I did, but it made it a much tighter product at the end. And so that got me to the finish line. I thought you might be interested as well to see, well, what um, what were some of the proposals around a book cover? Because, you know, people often say, did you create that? And like, no, I'm I'm not that talented. Um, so this was one of the first ones I thought, well, that actually conveys the sense I wanted to give in this uh, in this book of, you know, going from chaos to some kind of structure. And this was another one I thought, you know, disruption comes and pushes you off course. Well, what do we do to keep moving in the right direction? And even this decent. So I had a lot of good choices before landing on what became this book cover. And, and anyone I showed this to you said, this is absolutely the choice. Now, interestingly, uh, just a couple of weeks after making this decision, saying, here it is, we're locked in. This is the book cover. Something happened. Something happened about balloons. So if you're in North America, the news was this spy balloons cruising from the north came over Canada and down into the U.S. and finally got shot down by the U.S. Air Force. So we thought, do we need to change the book cover? And uh, the answer was no, we'll just leave it. In this case, we think publicity is good. The balloon was clearly a disruption for a lot of us in our, our daily work. Um, so 
we kept the, the cover as is. And here we have Dancing with Disruption. So with that, I'm going to get into the presentation. And I want to start by telling you a story. So an organization I was working for, this is several years ago now, large organization, uh, multinational, and made up of uh, several companies, so a conglomerate. And believe it or not, they were still using Excel spreadsheets to do their quarter ends and year ends and consolidating that. So massive, complex spreadsheets they were using. So they said, you know, we really need to modernize. It's too risky. We have errors. There's a lot of rework that happens every quarter end, year end. Can we do better? And so they decided we're going to replace all this with software. Big financial package that they were bringing in. And folks were happy about that because as the changed leader, I made sure they were aware of all the benefits. So this was going to reduce work for them. So rather than working these big spreadsheets, a lot of things now would take uh, data out of their systems and automatically pull it together and produce their consolidated financial statements. So we communicate, I mean, really blitzed. Um, letting them know these are all the benefits. This is what it's going to do for you. We we showed them screenshots. This is what it looks like. We did demos so they got a sense of how it would work. We told them that we would develop training for them. We let them know that the training would be anywhere from half a day to three days long, depending on the role. We started a countdown towards registration. And as registration came, of, of course, you know, great, they're going to sign up now. Very exciting. So registration day, please sign up. And we watched and the numbers went up, yes, and then leveled off. Thought, oh, that wasn't what we expected. So we did what any of you would do. We, we went to the manager and said, hey, can you give this a push? We really need people to sign up. And they did. Uh, and we saw another boost, yes, and it leveled off again. And now we know we, we've got a real issue here. Because if we don't get enough people signing up, uh, it's not something where you could look over your neighbor's shoulder and figure out they need the training. We need critical mass on this, or this is going to be a failure. So what do we do? We wondered, is this resistance? Or do they just not like it? What's going on here? Well, we're going to return to the story. Working with another organization, uh, we, they were coming up to a major change. They were ripping the heart out of their banking system and replacing it with something brand new. And I asked them, how are you feeling? And this was four weeks prior to go live. And we see these kinds of reactions. You will have seen them yourselves. Yes, people are excited. They're looking forward to it. Uh, they're glad, but also stressed, overwhelmed. Anxiety is creeping up. They're feeling tired because they're some of them were working double duty and doing their, their day job and then taking training. And so all these types of reactions are very common when we're looking at change. Is resistance represented in that? Maybe. So before we plunge into what this looks like and what we can do about it, I got to remind ourselves what the goal is. It is a return. So if you work in the area of change today, yes, we want to help people move from point A to point B, help them adapt in some way. Of course we do, but that's in service of the overarching goal. The organization is making a change because they need to compete or they need to um, streamline something to make them more efficient or save costs or increase their market share. They are looking for a return. So even though we work with people and we're looking to move them from point A to point B, we do that in service of the goal to create a return. And that's why the faster that we move people from where they are today to where they need to be matters. Because the slower it is, the more resistance we encounter, the harder it is to generate that return. And time is money. So what do we do? When people are looking at change, this is often the view they have. It's difficult, it's complicated to see how I'm going to get from here to there to adapt in some kind of positive way. Let's look at an example. Uh, let me introduce you to Joe. Uh, this is a shot taken in Toronto. Joe owns a hot dog stand, very popular hot dog stand. People come every day, he sells lots of hot dogs. You can say he's got quite an assortment of toppings there. And, and folks love to talk to Joe. And the city planner comes to him one day and says, Joe, we love your hot dogs, we love having you here, but unfortunately we're just about to start construction. 
And I was hoping we could just, you know, move you down one block that direction. And Joe looks down and says, yeah, that'd be okay. I, I know the area. I know people. Um, I'm sure they'll find me there. But unfortunately, we're going to have to tear up about four city blocks. Uh, the, the sidewalks are going to be closed off. And just in terms of safety, I can't have you close to this area. Um, so I'm going to need you to move 10 blocks to the north and east. And um, that's effective next week. So we're going to start putting up the pylons and stuff. And Joe's like, whoa, that's a big deal. So I'm using this scenario because I want to get your input. When we're looking at change, like Joe's about to experience, what are some of the barriers he might encounter? So in order to do this, um, I think we should have a bit of fun. So some of you will recognize the family view. And today's question, we'll try that again. What are the barriers to Joe's success? So let's say next week, he's got to be there in that new location, location B. What are some of the barriers to Joe's success in setting up shop there and running just as successful business as he does today? So I'm going to take your input. We went out and asked uh, the audience on the street, uh, what do they see as the barriers to success? And we've got eight responses here. I'll just hide the question. And I'm asking you now, please use the chat to respond and let us know what you think these barriers could be. Serge is going to monitor the chat and let me know when we have some responses. Serge, are we seeing anything yet? Yes, we are. We have a response uh, from Robert. He says low awareness from the customers. But he has more. Low awareness. So uh, there's a communication element in here. Very good. You know what? I didn't even think of that one. I have to be honest. So the marketing aspect. Mm -hmm. So I created this number eight with question marks so that if you give me an answer I haven't thought of, <laughs> we've got it covered. All right. What else do we have? We have more answers coming in. Uh, that's okay. Hold on. Uh, oh, I see. Susie put in their unwillingness to walk the 10 blocks. Um, uh, so now I'm going to assume that's about foot traffic and I see Maria has suggested that as well. So are his customers going to make the journey or is there decent foot traffic in the area that he can generate the same business he has today? Great responses. Uh, uh, Alex says the issue with permit. So now, that could be a In this you. case, um, that did not come up because he's already <laughs> So uh, sorry, uh, you get a strike on that one. What else? Uh, there are a few more. Uh, longer logistics to restock this car? Yes, actually, that's a good one. Um, transportation. So getting stuff to the site, including his hot dog cart. How's that going to happen? Okay, what else? Transportation and competitors. There are two Ooh, more. Oh, yes. Fifth answer, competition. So are there other hot dog vendors there? Or, you know, maybe you, that's an area that's that really loves falafels. I don't know. But yeah, that's a significant uh, element here. Good. Any others coming up? Um, I re no. Reveal the other answers. Oh, I think that's it. May primarily foot traffic and transportation and competition was the call. Oh, OK, let more. me show the others. All good. Um, so time. Um, it, and there's two of them to go together here. So how long is it going to take Joe to get there from his existing home every morning? So he likes to be there early and catch that morning crowd who just happens to like hot dogs for breakfast. Uh, so is there going to be an additional cost there for him? And also safety to my colleagues that are in Calgary. The news headlines lately have been uh, increased violence downtown. I don't know that area. Is it going to be safe? for Joe to sell hot dogs there, he's, is he at risk? And also demographics, in this case, people said language. We don't know Joe's background. Um, if there's a ethnic demographic in that area, and he doesn't speak the language, that could become a barrier. All right, good stuff. Thank you, folks. We didn't get three strikes. The last crowd didn't do as good, so good for you. So one of the, one of the reasons we start looking at why uh, individuals struggle with change is that they say, I can't, All right? So this is just, it's difficult for me. 
Uh, and some of the reasons for that are, we've got a few of them here. I didn't get the message. Now, this seems ridiculous. We're rolling out a change. You didn't get the message. But I want you to consider the size of your inbox. Now, some of you, I'm sure, are good at cleaning that up and ensuring I don't have that many. But for many of us, could be hundreds, even thousands of email app and messages sitting in that inbox. So what happens? We get all these communications. We tend to skim or I missed one. And I just, I didn't know that something was going on. So that's the first one. The second one is I didn't realize it applied to me. So I, I skimmed it so fast that I didn't get, oh, this impacts my job. I need to do something. And third, even if I understood that, okay, yeah, there's a change coming, it applies to me. I wasn't sure what to do. And that's a very common problem in communications that, all right, you've told me that something's happening, but what do I do? And when folks are feeling threatened about change, that's a big deal. I want to be able to do something. Otherwise, I feel like it's completely out of my control. And that is not a good sensation. Uh, third, uh, or relate to that last one, not knowing what to do. Perhaps the training hasn't rolled out yet or the training is poor. We've seen that. So folks go through the training, come out the other side and go, I'm still not sure I could actually do this. Well, we you say we're starting this new process or implementing this new system. Uh, fourth, I just haven't been given enough time here to really adapt. And I'm not talking about psychologically, it just practically of it's going to take me some practice time to actually feel comfortable doing what you're asking me to do. So I feel like I can't today. Fifth, I don't have the right tools or the right information. Uh, our local grocery store has implemented a, a new process. When you place your order online, you can select that. I'm going to bring my own bins. They have these standard bins. So I have bins from this grocery store. Happy to bring them with me. And the commitment is they will have freshly cleaned bins and they'll just swap them out into your car. It makes things a bit more faster. Twice I've shown up and they've said, yeah, we don't have our bins yet. Sorry, we'll just load them into your bins again. Like, well, what was the point of that? So asking for change, but not giving people the right tools or right information uh, uh, means they say, I, I can't do it. Or finally, change fatigue is becoming a much uh, more common expression and folks feeling like they're just out of gas. And not simply because they're managing all the other tasks they have at work, but even outside of work in their personal lives, they're they're struggling with the realities of uh, difficulties, changes they're facing in their personal lives that make it difficult to adapt at work. What do I mean by that? Well, let me introduce you to Janet. Janet works for Timpson. Timpson is a retailer in the UK, um, often commonly associated with engraving. So you need a gift for someone, you want to have their name put on it. That's what they do. But they have shops and they sell a number of things. So a, a fair number of employees there. Janet's role is director of happiness. Why do you need a director of happiness? Well, I love this concept. And in a recent interview, Janet said, I spend a third of my time dealing with employees' financial issues, helping them. Why would she do that? Because of this issue of change fatigue, that the fact that people are dealing with uh, aging parents or finances, where's the next uh, monthly rent going to come from? How can I stretch my dollars even further? Inflation's a problem. So she works with employees to help them renegotiate debt, renegotiate cell phone plans in order to quiet some of this stress people are feeling that takes away their capacity for change. So when we look at people are saying, I can't do this, there may be very practical reasons they need training, but there are other reasons that even outside of work, we have to pay attention to more and more. So when people say, I can't, the strategies are number one, clarity. Go back to the messaging. Have we made that clear? Or just ask them, did you understand what was in here? Did it answer the questions you got? How can I help you get the fact that you're going to need to do something different here? Competency. So I don't yet have the skills required for me to do something different. So training is required and good training quality. Capacity, so we've talked about that. We've got practical capacity, enabling people, uh, giving them the time to actually go and take the training, and then even emotional capacity by reducing stress and other areas. And I think overall, uh, coaching, 
having your middle management on board so that they can help people who are struggling and saying, I can't do this, to walk with them through this, very important. Second reason that people uh, say they're resisting is just, I won't, I won't do it. And when we hear that phrase, we think, okay, well, great. What are we going to do about them? We're going to have to take drastic action. But we really need to look deeper at this to, to see that, in fact, when we get pushback, it often happens on a continuum. It's not necessarily that we have to take drastic action. Let's look at this. So first of all, people perceive there's no with them, no what's in it for me. So if I don't see an advantage for myself, I don't see what the benefits will be for me as an individual, why should I do this? And the reality is in organizations today, this is quite common. So we have to upgrade the technologies. Like it's not even supported anymore. I've seen that many times. And yeah, you're gonna have a steep learning curve. It has to be done. And yeah, it does introduce some new features, but it's gonna feel like net pain at the beginning. So this is the reality. Often no with them. The next one up here, no consequences. So if I'm looking at this difficult change and I see that Murray isn't doing it and nothing's happening to Murray, maybe I don't need to do this either. I mean, net pain, why would I want to do this pain if I could just keep doing what I'm doing today? In fact, one of the quotes I love giving to executives is a reminder, when faced with difficult change, the easiest thing for people to do is nothing. That's the easiest thing for them to do. So if there's no whip them, there's no consequences, I could just stand still. When we see other people that are not moving, it makes us hesitate. So that's an issue. Leader accountability. So when leaders don't lead from the front, when they don't demonstrate that they are also being impacted by the change or need to embrace it in some way, that, that makes it harder for others to get in line and, and align with that. Uh, so when my manager doesn't support is a very common one. So I I commonly tell leaders beware of the word cascade. It get used gets used all the time. So I prepare my message. We will cascade it down through the organization, and everyone will get it, and we'll be good, right? Often broken telephone. The message doesn't come through properly, or managers just relay it and don't endorse it in any way, don't really help people understand how it applies to them. We need managers to play the role of translator, interpreter, making sure people get it. So if our middle layer of management is not on board, we have a significant disadvantage in helping people overcome resistance. Leaders not trustworthy. So we feel they're not giving us the full message. They're not being honest about what it's going to take to implement this change, that there is going to be pain. If they're just saying it's going to be wonderful, you're covered, not a problem. People sniff out immediately when that doesn't seem truthful, that there is going to be some loss involved. And if they feel they can wait it out, so there's a history in the organization that these initiatives come and go and nothing really seems to happen, eh, maybe I'll just wait. This will go away. Why expend the effort until then? Then the toughest category, people who hate everything and they're in almost every organization. They resist every type of change, whether there's a reason for them to do so or not. They don't like you and they don't like your change. They think it's dumb. And of course, the problem is if we let these people exist within the organization, they become a toxic element and they draw other people. They actually create fear. I'd be go against so-and-so. I mean, they seem pretty influential. They're certainly loud about it. So what do I do? I, I hesitate again. Remember our objective, return on investment. And we want to get there as fast as we can to generate that return. When we've got people who dig in their heels and will not be moved, something has to be done. Now, why do I have these colors? Because this is on a continuum and I invented a new word to demonstrate it. As we move from left to right, the difficulty of shifting a person's point of view, of getting them to adopt and embrace the change is harder. Some people on the right are highly entrenched. They will not move, they will never move. And so my counsel of leaders is deal with them Immediately, you have to. It sends an important message. It takes care of that element on the left hand side around consequences. There are consequences, they're real. 
It starts with looking at performance appraisal, but it moves to termination and job action as needed. So when people say I won't, it's not necessarily that they hate everything. They may just be struggling with the messaging and not seeing what the benefits are. So when we have I won't, we begin with clarity coming back to that messaging. And I strongly suggest that you consciously connect the dots between the change and clients, customers, community, and even country, the world. What are we doing here? If it doesn't benefit you as an individual, how is this helping our customer? I want to see impact on people. Does it help us deliver something faster that changes people's lives and make their lives easier? I can make that connection in any organization for any change. So can you. So connecting those dots, very important when people are saying, I won't. Coaching and consequences, we've spoken, spoken to. So letting people know you're there to support them. You will help them through, help them connect the dots. But if they are not aligning, there are real consequences for that. We can't play the nice guy, nice girl for the whole time. Credibility. If the leader doesn't have credibility, there are things you can do to build it. In the moment, uh, I often say, Make it clear where you've been involved in programs that have been successful in the past. How have you helped implement change before? That you have a track record that they can rely on. And over time, make sure you're leading from the front. Get, get out there. Be the first person in training. Sit at the front of the class. Have your picture taken using the new software or doing or getting in front of customers. I was pleased the other day I saw with, with Starbucks' new CEO that one of his commitments was, I'm going to be at the front line as a barista or working with customers once a month. Already has this green apron ready to go, is taking the training. That's leading from the front. It generates credibility. Third reason why people seem to resist is a, is a very real one. So they're afraid. And we know from psychology that emotions often trump logic. Even though you connected the dots, even though I see what the benefits are, I'm afraid to move forward. Well, why might they be afraid? History. So I've done changes like this before and it didn't go well. I struggled with it. Um, I feel like I failed during that. And even if we've been successful, we tend to remember the failures. They, they stick out stronger in our memory. That's a real barrier for individuals. Loss of power. And they won't tell you that this is a fear, but it is. So if I know this process cold today, people come to me and ask questions when they have a problem, or I'm the super user with the software. Well, when we change it all out, now it's a level playing field. We're all learning this together. I'm no longer the leader in that area. And so I fear that loss of influence. That's going to be a disadvantage for me. I really enjoyed that. Or a loss of face. And this to me is the most powerful one, regardless of whether I'm feeling good about the change and I've been successful in the past. But if I'm concerned, this is so complicated that when I try it, I'm going to fail in front of my peers and embarrass myself. I will hesitate. What can we do? Well, the solution comes from an unlikely source. Come with me to Ikea. Now, many of you have met Billy. You've been up close and personal with Billy. You've built a Billy. And the point here is, whatever you get from Ikea, in this case, a, a bookshelf, what do they do? If they only gave me that picture in the top left corner of the bookcase and said, build this, you got all these parts, good luck. The chances of me doing that successfully and it being able to support a book are somewhere around zero. It's not going to happen. So instead, what do they do? Well, Jeff. Surge, could you find those four boards in step one up here, top right, and find these little short wooden things and stick them in the holes? Yeah, I could do that. Then could you find the two long boards and get the screws out and put them in the holes we indicate? Yeah, okay, I could do that. And then step three and four. And by step 174, you now have a bookcase. But the point is, if you put that in front of me, you put this massive complicated change in front of me at the beginning, and I'm afraid I can't do that. It's too complicated. Remember Joe's hot dog stand? It's complicated for me to move all the way up there. I, I fear I'm going to fail. Well, let's just do one step. Let's get you to the location. Let's have you check it out. 
or step one, find those four boards, break it down. In this case, it's okay to have people take their eyes off the goal and just focus on something that's not going to overwhelm them. But there's more that IKEA has to teach us here. We blow up that top left section. Yeah, search. You're going to be fine because there are some tools you need that you already have. You've got some screwdrivers, you've got a pencil, you got a hammer. Yeah, okay, I've got that. We do this in change as well. We remind people, you've got skills that you're going to be able to use here. You're not starting from scratch. That's reassuring. But there are some things you don't have. Do you guys know what is always in the bag for an IKEA set that you don't have? I now have like 30 of them. It's that Allen key, right? So it's always in there because it's an uncommon tool, but you're going to need it. We will equip you. So tools you need, there's tools you already have, and we are going to help you with the ones you don't have. Let's look at the second box. Hey, eh? we got an X through an individual. Seems odd until we look to the right. So in order to be successful, I need to find someone else with oddly shaped elbows right, and a pencil behind their ear, and they will help me put this together. So yes, it's way more fun to build a bookcase with Surge or whoever your buddy is, uh, because when you run into problems, you have someone to work with you. So this is our managers as coaches, we or we use peer support or super users, people coming alongside, help take the fear down the panic when this won't fit into that hole. They're there to help us work through it. And the bottom one, you might get stuck, could happen. Don't worry about it. Failure is okay. This is not a message you would normally extract from here, but it's a critical one. I coach leaders to tell people failure is okay. We expect there's going to be some mistakes and errors because if surge connects two things that don't go together and taking apart is really difficult, he might be tempted to hide it. I don't want that. We need to fix the problem. So I tell him in advance, failure is okay. If you make a mistake, just tell us we can fix it. And publicizing that to the organization, Hey, this mistake was made. We're not here to shame anyone, but just that it was made and we were able to fix it. If this happens to you, let us know. Failure is okay. We normalize it. Here's the hotline to help, and we're going to share stories around that, both with success and failure. Normalize it. So, strategies for I'm afraid? Take people to IKEA. No, that's not it. Sorry. Uh, coaching. One step at a time. And that we're there to do it with them. Normalize failure. We expect that. We're not going to let you fall. So three responses to resistance. I can't, I won't, I'm afraid. And what can we do about it? Often comes back to communication, clarity. Here's what this change means. Here's what it means for you. Here's how to connect the dots between this change, which looks painful, and how it's gonna benefit people, clients, customers, community, our country, the world, competency. This is how we're going to get you to develop those skills. And you're not starting from scratch. You've already got a few. We're going to build on those. Capacity. Is there anything else competing for your attention? Do I need to help you with priorities so that you've got capacity to embrace this change? Consequence. You know, we really do need to do this. And if we don't do it, it could have an impact to the organization, our competitiveness. It impacts the return that we need to control our costs. But also to you, we're looking at your performance. We need you to embrace this. Credibility, demonstrating that the leader has done this before and is going to lead from the front. And coaching, getting our middle management on board and equipping them with skills many of them don't have today. They're not sure how to coach people when they say, I'm afraid. What do you do? So helping them learn that competency so they can lead others through change is critical. I want to come back to this story and then I'm going to finish up. So I want to encourage you, if you have questions, please do put them in the chat and then I'm going to ask Serge to, to tell me what they are so I can answer them for you. Uh, but coming back to our example, the story, people not signing up for training, of course, we went out and started asking people, what's going on here? Why aren't you registering? And what they told us is, <clears throat> Jeff, this training sounds great. Software sounds great. We get the benefits. We're bought in. That's not a problem. But our department runs really thin. We don't have any extra capacity. And our manager is still telling us we have to do all the work that's expected of us. So, yeah, we're taking the training, but today we're still working with all those spreadsheets. It's a lot of work putting all that together. Oh, 
right? So when you tell me I've got to take a one day or a three day course, I have to make up that time on my evenings, and my weekends. So your net gain, your benefit of, hey, we're giving you these great skills is net pain to me. It's a loss because I lose time with my family, my friends, working on my hobbies or just the downtime I need to get ready for the next week. Now we understood it's not resistance. Looks like it, but it's not resistance. It's a capacity issue. So what do we do? We brought in some temps. So let's delegate down to them the, the stuff that they can do on their own to free up your time and capacity. It wasn't perfect, but it was a lot better. And so folks got into the training and this deployment, total success worked. But we had to learn to reinterpret resistance and find out what was behind behind that. With proper diagnosis, we could get to a solution that worked for everyone. So three types of resistance, but we are able, we are able to coach people through that successfully. Thank you, folks. So questions, Serge, any questions I need to answer? Uh, nothing yet. All right. So if you liked what you heard today, this is a sample of what's in the book. I would encourage you certainly buy it, please. Uh, but beyond that, if you think this was great, we'd love you to do that for you've got a podcast in mind or a conference in mind. I would love to hear from you. And Serge, why don't you go ahead and throw that link in? So we've got a feedback form it allows you as well. If you want to recommend something or get in touch with me, uh, please do fill that out. If you submit a five star review and let me know on Amazon, um, I'd be happy to invite you to another session I've got coming up uh, from another chapter in the book, Creating the Tactical Buffet. So how to create uh, a rock solid change plan with all the elements that are going to make it as successful as possible. Also, if you buy five or more copies, you've got a team and you think this would be useful, we want people to look at it. Um, and I'll let folks, if you have the book, please do speak up and, and drop a comment in. It's not a long book. I actually set out when I write it to write a long book. I got lost to say. And what I ended up writing was a short book. I think it's somewhere around 160 pages with summaries at the end of each chapter. But the intent is to be impactful, very quick and impactful for people. Here's the tactics you can use and apply them right away. So very practical. So if you think that's a value, buy five or more copies, let me know and I'm ha happy to spend 30 minutes with your team to answer any questions or go deeper on a particular chapter. And the round courses, I've got two of them I'm working on. Uh, one will be uh, taking people through the elements of the book, leading change for managers. And then a second one, I've had some requests. Jeff, uh, you've done consulting your entire career. And this is true, it's very unique, uh, starting out with IBM 12 years and then on my own. Um, I've learned a lot about consulting and how to do that internally or externally as a vendor and uh, looking to relay that to people as well. So if that's of interest, drop me a line, say so in the in the feedback form, and I'd be happy to uh, let you know when that's available. Also, obviously, many of you who wear I have my impacted newsletter, always turning out good stuff for people, new thoughts and insights on change and strategy. Um, and lots of videos available, or you can just connect with me on LinkedIn. Serge, any other questions come up that I need to answer before we wrap up? Questions. There was a comment from Robert, though. Find an interesting comment, but no questions. Okay. All good. Well, folks, thank you. Um, Serge and I will be on here uh, for a little bit. We'll we'll wrap things up. If you still have questions, feel free to send them my way. Happy to get in touch with you, but I hope you got something valuable out of today's session. Thank you very much. Have a good one.